The success of Mooney Goes Wild is not just down to Derek. It's also been down to the panel of experts working on the program. And many of them have been with Derek from the very start. Like regular contributor Enani Launa. Well, but on the other hand, the other hand, I mean, will the, will the link Has it been a day or a week? Today, Anna is in Dublin city centre, recording a segment for the programme at the Natural History Museum. The first thing we're going to see is the exhibit that I suppose the museum is, is quite famous for, these huge collections of bones, the Irish deer. My involvement with the show came upon my brilliant career in RTE before that, because I was on radio I'd say 30 years ago, talking to John Skeehan, who has long since departed the radio waves, telling him about the sex life of dragonflies. And this so grabbed the attention of the world at large that they used to have me in and out to talk about things like this so that it would get the attention of people. But when Derek came along, a young whippersnapper in his early 20s, and he wanted to have balance, you understand, gender balance. So he had to get the book. There was actually a book at RTE then of women who could do things. Imagine. There was no book of men who could do things because men can all do everything, but there was a book of women and if you wanted a woman's voice on wildlife or you wanted a woman's voice on law or a woman's voice on whatever, you looked in the book. So Derek looked in the book, there was me, he has been to interview me about spiders it was, and of course I was better than anybody else because if you weren't, he'd be back to the men again. Women have to be better than everyone else. And Dana was better than everyone else. From the outset of the programme, the philosophy was simple to make nature more accessible. Because up until then, nature programmes on radio were quite stiff. It was always people with West British accents, mostly men, talking about it, referring to it in Latin terms. So nobody could understand a word that was going on and people just switched it off. It was just one academic speaking to another. So our programme wasn't to be like that. Our programme was to talk about wildlife so that when they heard what we were saying, they'd say, God, I never knew that. And it worked. The ratings started going up and up, with the team covering everything from bears to bees. And one of the areas that we're all very interested in in Ireland at the moment are bees. So you are very well equipped with bumblebee specimens, are you not? Yes, we have about... So people wrote us letters, they actually sent us in yokes, in bags. Remember they sent Derek a dead chaffinch once, the smell of it and knock a horse, to know what it actually was. And I was supposed to have the answer to everything. And sure, if I didn't know what it was, I made it up. We'll keep that little secret between us, Anna. Over in Clondalkin in Moyle Park College, Terry Flanagan is teaching science to transition year students. I'm a teacher here in this room. I've been in this room now for nearly 40 years. And when Terry isn't splitting atoms in the classroom, he's out reporting for Mooney Goes Wild. I actually have the best job on the programme because I get out to see everything. The others are stuck in studio. In the last month or so, I've been looking at barn owls down in Kerry. I've been looking at foxes in Dublin. I've been looking at Ireland's rarest butterfly down on the bog. I get out there, I meet the people, they tell me their story and I relate it and I bring it back and I, I put it out on air. Terry has reported on a myriad of stories over the years, but which one really stands out? with Philip McCabe when he was trying for a world record down in Tipperary and we were doing it live on air. The, the world record was to have as many bees as possible on his naked body. Uh, got something like 80,000 or 180,000. Didn't actually make the record, but I thought that was a great piece of radio. So when it comes down to it, which does he prefer? Teaching or broadcasting? Now there's a hard question. Can I not have the two of them? No, I love teaching. I love teaching. But I do love broadcasting as well. I love it. I love live broadcasting because you're doing it on the program. But then again, is that not what we're doing in class here all the time? It's live broadcasting here every day. The audience is here. The difference is these guys can answer you back or ask you questions there and there. Whereas when you're in studio, you don't see your audience. You're looking into a microphone. Another one of Derek's longest on-air contributors is zoologist Dr. Richard Collins who, among many other things, is also a member of the board here at Dublin Zoo. Uh, I fell into the broadcasting thing through swans. I was researching swans. I put these rings on, big white rings. I, I, I needed to find out where the swans were going. Uh, that's what I really needed to do. So I, I contacted a researcher named Brenda Moore on the way back uh, years ago. and she managed to get me on the Rodney Rice show in the mornings to make an appeal to the public 
to send me in records, sightings of swans with rings on their legs. And from that, from going on and talking about swans and trying to get people to tell me where swans were, suddenly they were asking me to come in and talk about barn owls and badgers and God knows what. And it was extraordinary, you know. And that he did. Barn owls, badgers, bees and bears. He covered it all. Richard often acts as the interpreter on the programme, taking complicated scientific studies and making them easier to digest. But the, uh, the object of the exercise is to find interesting material that the scientists are producing, express it in a palatable, ac um, approachable kind of way, and show the interest of it and the implications of it. And that's what we do, that's what we have tried to do. And like Terry, Richard has plenty of fond memories. Up in the Arctic, in the um, Swedish Lapland, in the middle of winter, uh, riding behind uh, the dogs, putting the sledge across frozen lakes, and the stillness of the cool night, and the stars up above, and the sheer otherworldliness of it. This weekend will be busy for the Mooney Goes Wild team, as once again they prepare for the annual broadcast of the Dawn Chorus. The six-hour marathon broadcast will link with various locations all over the country, but will be anchored from Cuscany Marsh Nature Reserve in Cove. Ornithologist Jim Wilson is Mooney's main man in Cork, and without Jim, there would be no dawn course. Well, as you know, this weekend is a big weekend for the Money Goes Wild programme, celebrating 20 years on air on RT Radio 1, and also 20 years of the Dawn Chorus. And this weekend... From midnight on Saturday through to 6am in the morning, you will hear the marathon broadcast of the Dawn Chorus. Our man at Cuscany Marsh Nature Reserve is none other than Jim Wilson. Jim! Well, Derek, everything's really going well down here. Fantastic weather. Uh, the birds are out and about, you know, they, they're a bit quiet at the moment, but as we know from previous years, we don't have to worry about the birds. They'll turn up and they will give us a show like no other. And so, yeah, fingers crossed and we're ready to go. Uh, every year, breeding season, the birds are proclaiming their territories and they do it by singing. We call it singing. They're probably calling it threatening the neighbours. Just after midnight, the magic begins when the team take to the airwaves. The birds are silent. But as dark turns to light, the birds wake up and begin to sing. As the dawn starts to come, the birds wake up. They have their natural alarm clock. They know when the daylight is starting to appear in the sky. And that's when they start singing to tell their neighbours, I've got my territory, I'm here. And that's what we capture so fantastically uh, on this broadcast. Even though the broadcast is throughout the night, podcasts and the RTE radio player mean that people all over the world can listen live or listen back. We have people tuning in from all over the world and with podcasts afterwards, even if you don't feel like getting up during the night with us, you can still get the experience because this is as important as the buildings we look after. The, the, you know, this, this dawn chorus, our ancestors, our forefathers, they've listened to it for millennia. It's, it's, it's incredible. So, after 20 years of bringing nature to the nation on Radio 1, how do the team feel? I am very proud of the Mooney Show and I'm very proud of the fact that a whole generation of people, 20 years is a long time, it's a whole generation of people who recognise my voice, who recognise the fact that I said this about spiders or they always remember the time I did such and such. I'm the insect, creepy crawly person and so as a result I'm delighted, particularly spiders, spiders are great. Do you know that they're cannibals, they eat each other. It's an extraordinary privilege for somebody like me, my third rate brain, to talk every week for 20 years, once a week, to an audience approaching a quarter of a million people. It's almost unjust, it's, it's, it's almost wrong, you know. But what we're trying to do is to generate an interest in science, have as many of them doing science and biology as possible, and hopefully that they'll go on to college and they'll study it. And I think with the likes of Nestwatch, with the likes of the Mooney Goes Wild Pro, it generates an interest. It's a different strand. All we're trying to do is get them interested. Most of my adult life has been uh, about primarily bringing the gospel of our natural heritage to the people of Ireland and beyond. And to have uh, the facility and be privileged enough to be involved in, in a major production that is the Dawn Chorus is, is, is my dream come through a hundredfold over, a thousandfold over. <laughs>